it sounds like there have been a lot of different types of uh, changes that have happened over the course of your lives, whether it's over uh, a short amount of years or a lot of years, um, in various vehicles that have been used to do that. And uh, I think that that's really beautiful. But I have a rhetorical question for you. Um, have you ever thought about yourself being the vehicle for other people and helping them improve their conflict resolution skills or maturing in this way? Um, I think that as students and leaders, no matter where your people are, um, whatever context you come from, or whatever church you serve at or organization, et cetera, um, no matter their level of maturity, they can always they always have room to grow and they always have the ability to reap from the dumb tax you've already paid in your time in ministry um, as it pertains to con conflict resolution. Um, and what they can learn they can learn from what you've learned in the past and what you're learning presently um, to reap the benefit of that dumb tax. I really love that term because it's like it's it's saying like I've me either messed up in the past or God has grown me. Please don't do what I did um, retrospectively. So now I'm going to share my, my plan for for this time. I'm just going to share like 10 um, pro tips of leading students through conflict resolution. Um, they're pretty brief, and I have them in summary form on the handout you have. Um, but this this part will go pretty quick on purpose because I want to hear more from you and hopefully spend a lot of our time just answering any questions or possibly troubleshooting. Um, I just want this time to be as helpful as possible. Amen? Okay, so um, does that sound good? Yep. Cool. Um, up first. Pray often. What a novel concept, I know. Um, I think there are things in the Grand Canyon of God's sovereignty, like in our lives, that we do not have simply because we do not ask for them. That comes in to be very true in our relationships. Like to, to pray for more understanding, uh, wisdom, humility, intelligence, courage, faith, empathy, etc. In conflict resolution, you can have those things uh, if you ask God for them. And what you are going through could be very, could, or the thing that you lead students through could very well be the thing that helps them gain those things. Does that make sense? Um, up next, I would say ensure that the scriptures are their foundation. Um, make sure that they are filter, seeking to filter their feelings, thoughts, tensions. Um, et cetera, through the sifter of the scriptures. Uh, ask questions regularly about God's word and how it is speaking to them about the current situation. For some, um, this will be your opportunity to hear them preach the gospel to themselves. Um, for others, it's your chance to remind them that God is the one that guides all successful conflict resolution. So regular feeding on his word is vital to maturation and spiritual insight. Three, don't underestimate the level of influence you have in your students' lives. I would encourage you to be a loving, empathetic truth teller to them. Loving, like, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 vibes. If you don't have love, you are nothing, you gain nothing, you have nothing. Um, empathetic, to understand that you were at one point, um, in, in some ways, may still be where they are. And so come to it with, with the desire to really understand their side of it. And also, lastly, truth teller. Be willing to tell them, hey, you might not be right in this, you know, or you really need to talk to this person, you know, like be, be willing to enter into the awkwardness of telling them what they may not want to hear, but ultimately need to. Um, and hopefully you can think, like you can think about those three attributes and think of someone who did that for you, someone who is an, a loving, empathetic truth teller to you, and it ultimately made you love and look more like Jesus. Next, remember that ultimately in where your students likely are in their development, more than anything, you're helping them learn self-awareness. Like you're really helping them understand this is what I bring to the table of this conversation, good or bad, and that's what's making it hard, and that's what will help me glorify God in this area, et cetera. And so remember that you're teaching self-awareness, and that's, really, that's a really hard thing to learn for most people in ages 
18 to 22 or during that time of college. And so embrace the challenge of teaching self-awareness to your people. Um, then I, I heard this quote from a pastor when I, when I was in college. He said, going through Cruddy Valley gets you to the man gets you to family mountain. So I say that because it helps those students and hopefully helps us remember that the goal of conflict isn't necessarily to be right or to be found wrong or to get to some certain solution, but as Christians specifically, it's peace, like truly peace. Um, and a lot of times I think <sighs> Peace is like an umbrella term for whatever we want it to mean that makes us feel better. So like if you're really direct in conflict, immaturely, um, that could mean I'm right and you did what I wanted you to do and good talk, you know? For people that are more indirect in conflict, it can mean, okay, we're done talking about the hard thing and you're not mad at me anymore, right? You know, like th those things can mean peace, but on this side, it could mean that you're un you, you, you fail to really see a brother or sister in Christ, um, and therefore, you know, you're failing that loving, emp empathetic truth teller part. Or if someone's passive, I think you've confused peace with quiet, and they're quite different. Um, and so you're really teaching people that, hey, going through the mess of talking about, hey, I need to check an assumption here, or have I wronged you in some way, please forgive me, those types of things do not come natural to us as new Christians or immature Christians or honestly as people in general, um, but to encounter it is very good and the dividend is very godly. Um, up next, ask them if they've talked to the person. I feel like that is so vital because, um, look, I don't really know about dudes, but I was in college ministry for several years with, with like, like college girls, and they would have this whole like universe of situations that had happened or could happen or, or all their feelings, which matter. But then I'm like, okay, so what, what happened when you talked to them? And they're like, oh, well, I haven't done that. And I'm like, you should do that, you know? Like, um, so I, I think the most direct first step after praying, after, you know, hearing about the situation is to ask, have you talked to them and how'd it go? Um, and that usually opens the door for, well, I haven't. Well, you should, you know, because how can you resolve conflict that you don't address? And um, how can you know? Um, how can you legitimately know like what needs to be addressed unless you bring it to the table of the, the relationship with the other person? Um, so yes, ask them if they've talked to the other person. Um, and it's most biblical because, as you see here, um, Matthew, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Um, I don't believe you can get more clear on what Christian in the church conflict resolution is to look like. Um, if you pair that in 1 Corinthians 13, it's like, this is an endeavor of love. Like if I find someone in sin or if someone confronts me in sin, hopefully it would be done, um, it would be walked on the foundation of this person loves me and I love them and we are a family. Um, and sometimes this happens in a really messy way. And as you navigate it for a lot of the first time for your students, um, please know um, that it was probably hard for Jesus' disciples too. Like, he had to say this to them probably a lot. Like, I'd imagine. I, that's me, not the, you know what I'm saying? I'll say this separate from the B-I-B-L-E. But, um, yes. Next, 
I would remind your students early and often that early as a leader, it's not a matter of if they will have conflict, and you may have felt this in your life and ministry and relationships, but when. Like, each of us comes to the table with so much good and bad, but baggage, you know, unresolved past conflict, views toward relationships, um, our own personality, our own strengths and shortcomings. And so when you meet another person, inevitably friction happens. But I think that's, again, an opportunity for it to refine you, not, you know, nullify the relationship. Um, anyone here that's married, you probably know this from like, and I'm, I'm not married, but I have this moment in mind that I know will happen, sadly, um, where I'll be like, by God's grace, I have a husband, and like we'll live together, and then like I'll be like, oh my gosh, I love you, we'll spend the rest of our lives together, God's glorified, amen. And then I'll feel, then I'll realize, oh my gosh, you're a sociopath, why do you put towels there? You know, like, and they're like, because it's where towels go, because like for my last, you know, 29 years of life, that's where the towels, that's where my mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother, that's where everyone put the towels, and I'm like, you are a murderer. Um, so, <laughs> so I don't know why towels is a thing that I'm like, uh, but um, if you're married or engaged in the room, you probably have felt that and you love this person so much. You feel like, no, you're it for me. Um, but we are obviously very different people and it, and it, it can emerge in really unsuspecting ways. But it's good to be knowledgeable that they will happen um, because it helps you be prayerful and prudent, and, and you can be saddened by it, by the, you know, the sting of like, oh, we have to have this hard, hard conversation. You can be saddened, but you shouldn't necessarily be shocked. Make sense? Cool, 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 cool. Up next, do not be afraid or ashamed to call in reinforcements. I, I hope you guys are a part of healthy, Bible-believing, um, you know, just awesome churches. That's my prayer. Um, and those people, no matter where you sit on the org chart of it, want to help you help your students strive for peace in the area of conflict resolution. And so whether that means, like if you're a resident and that means you're a direct supervisor, whether you are a direct supervisor and that means your direct supervisor, like your director, if you're a director and that means your deacons and elders, um, there will always be someone, usually in the body, um, that is older and wiser and that would love to help you navigate this. Um, in submission to the spirit and in the desire of preserving unity um, and preserving the witness of the church. Um, does that make sense? Uh, follow up. Much like the um, ask them if they've talked to the person, you will have to ask them again, have you talked to the person and how'd it go? Um, and I and I say this straight out of the well of my own experience. Um, I, you know, before Jackie Hill Perry like lit it on fire, I was a very big Enneagram component. Don't tell her I still kind of am, um, because I'd love to be friends with her someday, and I don't want her to find out <laughs> from your mouth to God's ear. Um, but, um, but I am a on the Enneagram. I am an eight wing nine, which means that I. I can be really good at challenging and, and at leaning in and advocating for those I feel like don't have a voice. But nine is like, I actually don't want to do that at all. Actually bring me a blanket and a warm beverage. Oh, I'm so, are you all right? Oh, like someone's missing. Okay. Dang. Okay. Well, I hope that person gets found. Oh, never mind. Traffic. Okay. Okay. But um, being in being those two like person those two like enneagram types really do have a lot of like contrast and friction with each other. And so I wouldn't necessarily lack the the desire to like address something, but that nine side would always kind of be the brakes to the car of it, if that makes sense. And your your students probably have some sort of like roadblock to that as well. And so whatever that is, that's fine. But it's still, it's like uh, I used I used to have a, a an analogy like you are a mailman for the gospel. You are a mailman for 
conflict. <laughs> um, and you could be delivering a publisher's clearinghouse check for a million dollars and they would be so happy to receive it. Or you could be delivering, I'm trying to say like, like you've been sued or like someone saying you've been served, you know, and they're like, get the heck out of my face. I hate that, you know. But either way, you have been employed by the U.S. Postal Service and you have to deliver whatever message God has given you in that time. Um, and so remind your students they are mailmen of conflict resolution, godly conflict resolution. And whether it's received well or received not well, um, they still have a duty to be obedient and to be faithful, not just to them as a you know leader or a student within your ministry, but ultimately to Jesus. And so remind them that if they trouble, if they have trouble with asking, like with actually addressing it, um, it's just another opportunity for you to preach the gospel to them in your follow-up. Up next. And lastly, there is grace for every situation. Um, I encountered a lot of conflict as a student, as a student leader, as a college staffer, now as a regular, regular schmegler adult. And over and over and over, I think that is the biggest need to remember that there will be ways that your students will just continue to fail in this area. Shocking, I know, um, but it's okay because we are striving for the upward call of following Christ, not perfection. Um, and I think I wrote something here on the last page. Um, at the end of the day, be well acquainted with the unfortunate truth that your students will likely still fail to have conflict in a healthy manner. Shocking, I know. They will fail, and so will you, in terms of giving advice or, or listening well or showing empathy or being empathetic. Um, you will fail, too. Um, while writing and preparing this myself, the Holy Spirit convicted me about some conversations I needed to have with some folks on my team um, back at my church. And I did because I, I really felt uh, in the moment like such a hypocrite to like, you know, have these like pro tips. And I'm like, but I don't want to talk to Gil, you know, um, his name's not Gil. That's just I feel like no one knows a Gil. So that felt good to say. Um, <laughs> If you know a Gil, I'm sorry. He's probably a wonderful man. Um, but yes, like <laughs> there will be times that in talking to someone, you'll just realize you need to remind them, hey, this could be what does you in if the grave ain't empty, but it is. You will need to remind that to yourself often, not just in conflict resolution, but like just as a believer in life. Um, but it will show its head in conflict resolution, and especially in helping younger believers navigate com conflict resolution because they're young, they're zealous, they're, they love Jesus, but you think about, I mean, I don't know how long any of you has been a believer, but the first year of that, by God's grace, you suck at it and you don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like for the first seven years of doing anything, you suck at it and you have no idea. You're like, I've been married for four years. I think we're doing really good. You suck at it, but you don't know. Um, and that is true of this, you know, but remember that where sin runs deep, grace runs deeper. Um, okay, so um, I think it's important in that journey of leading and loving your students to remember that you never fully arrive. They don't, you don't. We arrive when we arrive in heaven or Jesus comes back whichever comes first. Um, and to quote the great philosopher, Detroit rapper, Big Sean. <laughs> they're like, mm, mm, speak, speak. Um, we can turn our L's into lessons. Um, an put another way, there's a pastor at my church named John, Dan John Dansby, and he says, when, when things happen in ministry that you don't predict or that go awry, it's not a loss, it's data. It's an opportunity to learn, grow, and understand. Um, and that's also true in this, you know? Um, so I believe that's, yeah, I believe that's all of them. Um, if I put all of these in abbreviated fashion on the handout, um, but please, like, 
My email is Persia at Austin Stone, P-U-R-S-H-I-A. Don't spell it like the country. I don't know why my mom did that to me and everyone I would meet, but it's P-U-R-S-H-I-A at AustinStone.org. If you have any questions or if during the time we have left of questions and answers, you don't get to ask what you need because I would love to help in any way that I can. Um, yes. So without further ado, what are your questions and my possible answers? You, sir. Cody. So, we're from Great Hope Baptist in Austin, and our college ministry is, like, not doing well. That's why we're kind of here to, like, learn. Because they just, like, instead of a leadership group. Mm -hmm. And this is, like, our first step to, like, learn. Yeah. So, we have a lot of conflict in the leadership team. Like, a lot of conflict. So, this is, like, student-oriented, but what are, like, tips we could use with, mm -hmm. like, there's four of us. Mm -hmm. with the, between the four of us mm -hmm. to resolve those issues. What's an issue? What's an example? Like, we don't necessarily agree with, like, stuff that we, like, do weekly because mm -hmm. we don't do much. Mm -hmm. We don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Okay. okay. Do something. No. <laughs> There's a lot of change going on in the church, and it's, mm -hmm. it seems as if, like, the college ministry has been left out to dry. Yeah. So we're kind of, like, supposed to be started. How old is your church? I've only been a Christian for a year, so I've... Praise God. <laughs> yeah, he's like, this is me. Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, well, welcome to the family, brother. You know, um, and okay, um, I would say, depending on the health of your church, depending on the health of your elders, your leaders, etc. Um, I once heard it that um, where the leaders are, so goes the rest of the organization. And I don't say that as like a fix, but kind of to give some like perspective of like, depending on the health of your broader body, that will inevitably trickle down to everyone underneath the leadership of it, if that, if that makes sense. And so I say that broadly and generally, I don't know your, your church specifically. And so I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak without perspective, but I think um, greater perspective of like, for each of your, your like, your specific sphere of influence, I think a needed reminder would be um, from the Lord, like, Lord, you called me here for this time with these people to this purpose, to this place. Help me be a conduit of peace and rec reconciliation where I can. Um, and for a lot of things, that would mean you going on the like lifelong journey of getting well acquainted with the scriptures and calling out where you feel like your specific, I don't mean, <laughs> what I'm not saying is like, I'm going to email the senior pastor and tell him where he's messing up. You know, like that, I don't think that's a good first step. You know what I'm saying? But in your specific fear of in influence with the people that God has put around you to love and be loved by, um, there's a way to be a light even amongst them. Um, and to still say hard things and to say, hey, I think we're all striving to be heard and we're not striving to hear. I feel like we are not prayerful in how we talk about one another and plan events um, that we hope to have, maybe, you know, like I think there's ways to embody Christian character, even when it does feel like the whole building's on fire, you know, for whatever reason, you know, um, and I think. That's where I would really center in on where appropriate and where helpful to really go up to leadership and say, hey, we're, I know that this is all kind of struggling right now, but we're really struggling and I still need help because that's what your leaders sign up for. That's what deacons, elders, directors, like that's what they sign up for is to help you lead well. You know, that's just a part of upward leadership. That's the responsibility that you take on. Um, so don't feel... In that, it feels like important to say, like, don't feel like they're overwhelmed if you go to them for help. You know, um, I doubt that they would be like, just figure it out. You know, um, that would be very unhelpful. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Bless you, Cody. All right, another. I have a question. Oh, oh. Drew. I'll get you after. Hello, Drew. Sorry, I thought you were pointing at me, so I just went for it. You, I am now. Yeah, um, there you go. The, uh, I'm from Hyatt. 
Island Baptist Church in Waco, Texas. So oh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One of the things that I have uh, experienced a lot over the years, but especially even lately, is conflict resolution uh, with between students and their parents. Mm-hmm. Kind of that crossfade. Of, yeah. What will my job be? You know, they may or not have Christian parents. You know, should I get yeah. married to this person? Yeah. Or even just like past trauma, you know, from yeah. childhood. So like, a, you know, Zoom has accelerated the opportunities to, to moderate some of those moments or things like that. Do yeah. you have experience with that? Do you have ways to kind of apply this to, you know, students tend to be more teachable and open and formable. Parents tend to be more kind of set in the ways. ways. You know, so how do you manage those two universities uh, if you have any suggestions? Yes, that's a really good question. I do have several um, situations that came to my mind where whether it be because of someone's like getting married or honestly for the first time in their life taking their faith seriously like taking it in their own hands not just doing whatever their parents did whether that was being churched or not being christian or not um that's a watershed moment in anyone's development and specifically for college students i've said in in other kind of settings like this when someone From the ages of 18 to 22, by the time you get out of college and by the time you turn about 25, a lot of, I read in a book once, uh, I don't remember the name of the book, so I'm sorry, but eight out of 10 of your like deep, ethical, philosophical questions have been answered, whether you realize it or not. And so because of that, those eight to 10 questions, that student is like, they're gathering information at a rate that they never have before about this world, who they are, who they want to be. And you hope, I mean, the reason that college ministry exists is because you want to hop into that cross section of this watershed moment in their life and say, Jesus is the answer. Whatever the, whatever the question is, Jesus is the answer. For some, that's like, great. Like, that's what their parents hope for. That's what, you know, that's the, the game plan, you know. For some, it's like, yeah, but I didn't want you to be a Baptist doing it. Or I didn't want you to, you know what I'm saying? Like, whatever the thing, I'm not saying, like, pro-Baptist, you know, but, I, but like, that was a real conflict for several girls that I discipled is, like, I love this church so much, and I, I feel like I should be baptized, and, like, but, like, my parents baptized me as a baby, and they're not really cool with that. You know, there's just those types of situations, like, all of what you said. But I think the thing that feels right to say is, like, um, when you're navigating someone's relationship with their parents, I would just stress ultimately that God is a good, good father. And though there there may be times that he calls us to something that is contrary to what our earthly parents are calling us to or challenging us to or whatever, um, you're a part of another family, you know? Um, and, And again, I say that with such like open handedness and humility because that can be really, really difficult. Because for the first, a lot of times, for the first time in someone's whole life, they're starting to genuinely serve another master. You know, even if they've been a Christian for a long time, it's just like, but I've kind of had to do what you're, you tell me to do before turning 18 because that's, you're my parent, you know what I mean? So now it's like, no, like I, I have to figure out, like, does obedience to God mean disobedience or breaking away or even displeasing my earthly parents. And some people are like, that's like incredibly difficult. I, I know for me, being a, 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 a daughter of a single parent, a single black mother, um, when I told her I wanted to go into ministry to be a resident and raise my support and not go to law school, um, she thought I was a demon, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> But 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 that was a that was a really profuse growing period for me in my, my in in my walk with Jesus because it was like I know that I really feel that if I don't do this I'm in disobedience to you. I know that if I do that thing I'm in disobedience to my mom. God help me cuz up until this point my mom is the most important relationship in my life next to you now, you know? And so I think with all of what I've said, with the whole salad bowl of what I've said, um, I think be someone that listens well, be someone that asks thorough, helpful questions so that you really understand the situation that they're faced with, pray for them often, and tell them the truth when they need to hear it. The best you know how to do, 
You know what I mean? Because uh, there's so many things I look back on as a leader, as a, as a discipler of, you know, college, young adult, now regular, regular, regular adult women that I look back on and feel like, oh, man, that was the wrong thing to say. You know, but um, I think God hopefully covers us in such a providential way that his grace surrounds those situations so I don't have to carry guilt. But in the moment, now, you know, seeking to, like, be equipped well, truly be an empathetic, loving truth teller and prayerful. Um, because every situation is different. Every student's different. Every parent-child dynamic is different. Um, also, for those that have not had it before, and, and if there's like a setup within your church for like helping them find counseling, incredibly pivotal. I, I think it's a professional help when it comes to trauma and all of that. Yes, like trauma. Like, Legitimately, like like this is where reinforcements of so many different types are incredibly helpful. And though I, I'm, I would not be here if Jesus if Jesus wasn't my great physician. I also have a counselor that I see weekly, and need to because there's things that in the in the in your little, not your but like generally in our little toolboxes of life that we are just not set up to handle on our own, and not just like both in terms of the church, in terms of other people in community, and in terms of like a trained, unbiased clinical professional who probably also loves Jesus and just wants to help you, you know? Um, so yes, is that helpful? Praise God, yes, yes, yes. I know, oh wait, who was it? Who was it? You there, hello. I might have already answered my question, but I'm a verbal processor. I love it. So um, right up in the church, I didn't really like I wasn't given the best advice for conflict resolution, mm -hmm. and when I tried it, basically it was all my fault, and I never tried conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And so the I'm sorry. response to it was like de defensive for the rest of the time. Like mm -hmm. anytime conflict came up, I'm defensive. Like I'm gonna tell you that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess that makes it like really hesitant for me when students. I, I'm an intern for student ministry, not college ministry, but. Mm -hmm. When students come to me mm -hmm. and they want to talk about their problems, like with yeah. another person, I'm hesitant to like say, "Well, have you talked to them already?" Mm -hmm. In some mm -hmm. way, because mm -hmm. they might not know how to handle conflict. Yeah. So, is there a space in that moment to like, instead of saying, "Go talk to them and mm -hmm. then come back," yeah, teach them, and then like, what does that look like in the moment instead of like, because I know yeah. you gave us steps, but mm -hmm. like, what does that look like in the moment? Indeed, I mean. Uh, this is where knowing your student helps, you know what I mean? It, it's where this stops being just a catch-all for all and like truly to apply. Because for some people, it might just be a, how would you feel if, how would you feel about just a, like addressing what you're sharing with me? And thank you for trusting me with it. Um, how would you feel about addressing this directly with that person? And that becomes a tree of like, I'd feel great about it because I really want to stick it to them. You know, like whatever their thing is, or that would terrify me. And that's an opportunity to, to ask them why and to, you know, every time you have a conversation like that, it the goal really isn't to, to get them to do something. That's a hope. Like if you feel like there's an area where they can walk in further obedience, because obedience leads to joy, amen. But it's an opportunity for you as a minister to really see where they are, like to see them. And this is where um, I think just getting more and more reps of discipling people and, 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 and growing in your ability to be pastoral um, really is pivotal because again like every person every situation like you said is different and so you don't want to just tack on the band-aid of do xyz because they can need one two three you know and so I think grow in pastoral effectiveness and that truly just happens through prayerful committed uh discipleship relationships um because yeah like like truly all of the things that you said are true like someone could not need that like just go talk to them, come back to me, tell me how it was. You know what I mean? Um, I think, especially like if you're like in students' ministry, for some of them, it's like, what if that person's my dad? You know what I mean? Like, what if that person's my teacher? What if that's someone that there are, whether they can really conceptualize it or not, what if it's someone that there are inset power dynamics that I can't really do anything with at 12 or at 14? 
You know what I mean? Like that's a much more complex situation. Could be simpler in how you handle it because it could just be like, keep it to yourself. You know, like, you know, but like it's a much more complex thing than like, hey, if we're both 22 year olds and it's truly just a peer to peer situation and you got to stop drinking so much. You know what I mean? Like, so th does that make sense? Like a, be aware of the complexity of that individual's com uh, complexity of their situation. Know them, pray for them, love them, know where they're actually, where they actually are in terms of pastoral effectiveness. And then through the lens of some of these things, um, counsel them the best way you know how, you know? And that's also where like truly like calling in reinforcements truly becomes very important because a lot of that stuff, it feels like, oh, this is just kind of like an everyday thing, but listen well for those types of like, is abuse happening? You know what I mean? Like, or is this something that I really do need to probably report? Or um, like those types of things. But if it is like a, a thing where that person just needs to be kind of counseled through some things, be prepared to do that. But if it does reach a point where it's like, okay, I think you know the right stuff, you really just probably need to talk to the person because otherwise, if you don't, you're walking in sin because you're walking in bitterness toward them. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yes. What is your name? Claire. Hello, Claire. Oh, you there? Yes. Um, just to speak to the situation a little bit, and so forth, and something that I felt was like the most helpful thing to learn was never estimate, underestimating the power of role play. So practically, that could look like, um, okay, you know, we've talked about it, and I know you're, you want to go talk to a person, but that's scary. Do you want to role play? And you can come to me, and we can have the start the conversation, and like maybe you can bring up some things that the person might say, and they can, you know, practice what that feels like. Indeed, 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 indeed. Yes, hello. Um, idea to have a team clear the airtime and what's the best way to lead that? That's a really good question. What's the size of your team? What's the situation? Eight people. Okay. How long have y'all done? Okay. And it's student-led. Yeah. Just all students. Yes. Okay. How long have y'all, just this year, have y'all served together? Okay. I've been a part of some of those. <laughs> Indeed. I think that they happen and they are to be navigated when they happen. Um, and sometimes it can be an environment that people really do feel comfortable to share things that possibly in a one-on-one -on -one setting or, you know, in another environment, they wouldn't feel comfortable. So I think there's ways that it can be conducive with people that do not have a lot of relational equity or trust with one another, like in terms of team setting, which I don't know if y'all have or not, um, that can prove to be really damaging. Um, but just like if no one says anything, that can be really damaging, you know? Um, but I think if you, if you decide to do that, you know, I think truly have some like, I think of like a bowling alley, you know, and they have the buffers for like kids that can't bowl, you know, or me. Um, and and um, there's just some set parameters of like, hey, we're going to talk about possibly like this specific thing, you know, not the ministry as a whole, not just what you think about everything, you know, but like this specific situation, this specific part of our ministry that we know needs reworking. And that could be the very dynamics of the team, you know, but I think those things happen on the other side of developing a lot of trust and a lot of, hey, like, I'm committed here. We love each other. Like those things are like understood underpinnings of that type of environment and situation that get gained over time. You know, and like, and like weathering the storm and doing a lot of hard things together and um, God continuing to be faithful even through our missteps and, you know, those types of things. So I think be specific. And even you could even frame it not in a way of like, we just want to clear the air. Um, sometimes that is needed. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes you can reframe that and make the conversation a little bit more helpful, which like so if you did like a SWAT of a certain thing and like said as a team. Our team 
and we did this on my, my women's team um, recently. We did SWATs, which if you know what that means, just don't listen to me. But strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. I think that puts, it, puts the target on like completing this exercise, not you didn't come to my thing last week and I hate you. You know what I mean? Because it, it could just quickly turn into that. You know? or, or everyone feels so immobilized by lack of trust that no one says anything. And so I would say, um, cre like find the right parameters for, parameters for that team and what needs to what likely needs to be addressed, and find the right way to put it before them so that helpful, productive, God glorifying conversation and discourse happens that doesn't overall damage the team. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. I see. I saw a couple. What oh, you? I think you rose your hand, and then I'll get to you. Go to go. So like. Back, going back on the question that was asked earlier about like parents and children conflicts. Mm -hmm. So like I was born and raised as a Methodist mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of transitioning over to a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And I still I still okay, well I still go to my Methodist church and mm -hmm. I'm part of our praise band. But mm -hmm. my parents and I have very strong personalities and they don't really like the fact that I'm not going to their church anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's tough yeah. because yeah. I love them. And Indeed. I still want a good relationship with them. Indeed. But I'm also becoming my own person. And an adult, Indeed. And I would very much like some advice on how yeah. to kind of handle that sort of situation. Yeah. Um, do you still live with them? Yes, unfortunately. Okay, okay. I don't mean that in a bad way. No, no, like, but it's a, it's a real thing. It's it different is. if, like, it's like, I don't want to worship God the way that you do. Can you still help me pay my rent? You know, or can I still live with you? You know what I'm saying? That, that's a different dynamic. Yeah, and if I had the opportunity to be able to move out, I would. Yeah. I just financially cannot yeah. afford it at the moment. So I kind of have to make the most of what I have at home. Indeed, indeed. Which is, which is fine. Yeah. You know, just, it's, it's still hard for me. Indeed. A lot of well, one, um, thank you for sharing with, with us, you know, um, because, again, like that is... I really mean it, especially to, to college students and college staffers, et cetera, that dynamic of when you go from like being a kid, being a literal like minor kid dependent of your parents to like forming your own opinions, forming your own ethics, forming your own et cetera, um, that is a, a real like edge of the cliff type moment, both to you and your parents. Um, Man, I, I would, I would want to like sit down with you and just say like, okay, like, what is the dynamic with your parents, and like, do, are you able to voice disagreement? You know what I'm saying? Like, because again, that's that's not a situation you just place a bandaid on, you know. But I think whoever is your like leadership at y'all's like college ministry or organization. I would go to them and just say, hey, I, I really need help navigating this specific part of this because whichever church you want to be a part of, like, because I feel called here, but I feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place between the parents that I still in some way submit to um, and that, that feels right to say um, and what I feel like is good for my flourishing as a believer on this side. Those feel intention. I'm not saying that they are, but those feel intention with each other. Can you help me navigate that? Um, because they may not have all the answers, but you won't feel as like on an island figuring that out by yourself. You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. But also, I'm sorry, because my first uh, two years of being a resident, I still lived with my mom. and. It was hard, you know, and, and, and legitimately before you get married, before you have your, your own kids, by God's grace, you know, those are two of your most important relationships. And so you feel that even if you're like, well, I don't care, I'm going to do whatever I want. You still can't escape the felt reality of like, I know in some way I'm displeasing them. You know, and that's hard. Like, I think there's room to find next steps to do while being OK with like, being being able to lament and grieve that, you know, because it's from the the ashes of that that real like potential for uh, redemptive conversation and restoration of relationship to happen. Is that helpful? Yes, ma'am. Praise God for him. Also, no one has ever said yes, ma'am, to me. That is crazy. Huh. <laughs>
goodness, bless you. Um, all right. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, SWAT, yes. Um, it is an exercise that teams go about doing, and it's called SWAT, um, and it means strengths. We, I don't know why I'm doing it here. That, it doesn't say it on here, but like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And usually our team does that after like a big event where it was all hands on deck and there was a big like endeavor or goal or after a long season of ministry together, like after a full calendar year of doing ministry together, you come together and say, okay, our team, our mission, vision, purpose, all of that's on the table. What are the strengths? What do we do well? What benefits our people? What should we keep doing and keep maximizing because it's successful? What is God blessing? And then weaknesses. What are we not good at? Like what's the other side of that coin? And like, what is hurting us because we don't have eyes to see it, or we just need to grow in some areas in whatever way that is. Opportunities, what's a chance for us to further maximize ministry or leadership or development or whatever the thing is for the glory of God and for the flourishing of us and our people? And then threats, I oftentimes view what are uh, weaknesses in the short term become threats in the long term, which means what truly is killing us? you know, and what things in the threat or the weaknesses category are we not looking at and they will go on to become, you know what I mean? So that's what, that's what that is. You can find tons of stuff. Like I found a, um, our team has like a little four block thing. There's just like a a bunch of like Google images of like SWAT exercises and how to, you know what I mean? Um, So yes, yes. So coming into like a new group and stuff like that, how would you start having folks like not more of like you know where do we all feel personally like mm-hmm. where our feelings are and things are weak and stuff but like mm-hmm. how as we how can we as a team like identify our strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats mm-hmm. how would you start that in yeah, I, I would say you could start small. Like after, like I don't know if y'all have like a midweek gathering or like an end of semester party or whatever, but like after you all finish doing some big um, thing <laughs> together to come in your next staff meeting and either you or, you know, like if you're the one that runs the team, you're like, hey, like we're going to do what is called a SWAT exercise after X, Y, Z. And you can regurgitate, again, email me and we can like set up a time to like, I can be like, this is what this means. Not in this setting. You know, it feels like, I know it can feel like I'm, you're taking a sip from a fire hydrant with everything I'm saying, but like, um, <laughs> you know, but, but I would say after like some event or after a series of events, I think your your people, if they're really bought in, like your staff, um, they will want to help assess like how can we make this incredible, you know, and and why is it incredible? Uh, what makes it not sometimes? Uh, what's an opportunity for growth? And then what would overall be a threat to this being effective? So like a debrief after. Yeah, like deep, like truly, this is a very much debrief type exercise. Another. You there. (laughs) When is it okay to address someone else's sin? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) That's a word for someone. Um, Yes. We're we're kind of creating, we're not trying to, but sometimes we create a conflict. Yeah. And I can even... Make it a little more specific, mm-hmm. maybe a little more complicated and vague at the same time. <laughs> um, there are specifically a lot of people, a lot of my close friends, yeah. that, uh, and I don't even know fully, I've tried to research them, would like to hear your thoughts on when a lot of believers mm-hmm. on my campus are mm-hmm. getting into relationships with non believers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes that's leading to bad things, sometimes it's not, but sometimes they're, you know. And like I recently, we had a 72 hour prayer fit, and there were several mm-hmm. of those cards that they yeah. write, what are your deepest prayers? And they yeah. put it up. Several of them, that God would save my boyfriend, that God would save mm-hmm. my girlfriend. So there's tons of people that yeah. are, once they're already saved, engaging in that. Yeah. Some, I know that's something that's super personal to people, and it's something that's their, their passion and yeah. their heart is towards this other person. Yeah. But then there's God. Is that hindering their relationship? Yeah. yeah. So that's, 
there's the first question, and then yeah. there's kind of the deeper one where I'm like, there's lots of people around me that are doing this. Should I address this with them? Mm -hmm. I would say, depending on the level of closeness of the relationship, um, like if your accountability partner is with them, or if there's someone that you disciple, or if there's someone, honestly, if someone a peer that you're leading with, those are, those are people that you have the direct, I would hope, I have the card, you know, to call you out, you know, um, and mutual. Like, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing to say, like, am I going to call you out? Yes. You can call me out, too, because we're mutually sharpening one another. In the, the 72 hour prayer event that you're talking about, if it's someone that probably shared something anonymously, or you know, with the hope yeah. of like, I, I just, fun. yeah, hey, you put this prayer really personally. Um, I just want to tell you why that's sin. And I'm not going to pray for it, I'm going to pray for your soul. Like, I don't think that you're going to win them over. I don't, you know, weirdly enough. Um, but I think this is where relationship and relate, relate, re relational capital and equity matter a lot. But Again, you're a gospel mailman, you know what I mean? But like, I think there's times that God, always be a truth teller, you know, say everything, everything you say has to be true, but not everything, you, you don't have to say everything that is true. And sometimes there's just not the opportunity to both love that person well, if you don't really know them or know the context of the story or whatever, you know, but like, but like if a student comes to you and it's like, hey, like, I'm dating a non-believer, help me. That's your open field to be like, break up with them. You know, like, <laughs> like you know, that, that's your opportunity. Um, where you feel like there should be like direct obedience and like, ugh, like you need to stop doing that. You know, I would ask the Lord for wisdom, for discernment, for tact, um, and where you feel like you have the relational equity to do so. You know what I mean? Because there's a difference between I don't really know this person and I see them walking in sin um, because why would they trust you? You know what I mean? And like, hey, dude, I see you every week and I just see sin beating the crap out of you. I'm with you in this. Like, how, like I'm with you to partner with you in this. And, and, and I'm not judging you. God's not judging you. And it's okay to be where you are in this. But part of God's grace is that he's not going to leave you there. You know, like there's just depending on your level of love of that person, ability to pray for them faithfully, and like y'all's level of trust built up over the time that you've known one another and done life together or that you've been pouring into them or whatever, um, you'll have the, the, and the Holy Spirit just supplies so much in this time, you know? And so I hope that's helpful. Good, good, good. What is your name? Isaiah. Hello, Isaiah. Greetings. Okay, we have time for maybe one more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes. A more specific controversial topic would be addressing someone's sin and sexuality mm. as part of the LGBT community. How should we, as people who are not judging and want to lead yeah. to kind of get out of that lie, able yeah. to be like, hey, look, you know, I'm not judging or anything, but I'm going to lead you to this place. Yeah. Yeah. Child. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, but <laughs> I think I think that specific person, their specific story, their specific relationship to the church matter a lot in how you talk to them, how you counsel them, and how ready you feel to enter that conversation. Like, um, do you know what the scriptures explicitly say? And um, there are several like resources that over the past few years, as it pertains to um, sexuality in this specific cultural moment, um, that really would be good to have, like as men, especially as college ministers in this time, that would be really good to, to, to read. Like I would say over the summer, if y'all got budget for it, which shoot, in a recession, don't nobody. But like there's a book called Rethinking Sexuality by Julie Slattery. And she's a, a, a clinical, like, counselor type professional person or whatever. And like that book specifically is incredible on like, what do I do if I'm, you know, or, or someone that I'm ministering to or whatever, you know what I mean? And it's not just what do I do? And it's not just what God says, but it's like, it's beautiful that God has displayed 
gender, sexuality in this way. Here's how sin and honestly a lot of like cultural like Christian subculture taints that and just general secular sin taints that but this is what God really wants it to be with Jesus and and how all those things are different and why it will be hard to address those things but why we still need to you know and so I I say that of like I'm still I reread that book every year because in this cultural moment what used to be conversations about um explicitly about like is someone a Calvinist? Is someone a X, Y, Z? Like those conversations have progressed into specifically about gender, sexuality, and race. And so we can't try to treat that, again, like a Band-Aid, but like coming to the table well-read, prayerful, both well-read in terms of like what's out there to help Christians navigate this and the scriptures, help inform, hopefully you, you lovingly helping someone else navigate what they probably already have a really secular or guilt-driven narrative from the church and not Jesus, but the church, unfortunately. And you're like, hey, both of these things may be help like guiding you in this, but there's another way, you know what I mean? Um, and so I think, yeah, that book, Rethinking Sexuality by Julie Slattery, really, really helpful, in, especially in terms of where to start. Because she even has like appendices at, appendices at the end of it where it's like, how do I say this? You know what I mean? And, and, and she's just really, really wise, really godly, has done a lot of like helping churches navigate the, the realm of sexuality in a really helpful way. Um, so yes. Okay. Well, let me pray. Um, thank y'all so much for being here. Um, my mouth is dry. Um, and again, my email is persia at austinstone.org. If you, if you didn't get to a- ask your question, um, please, reach out to me. Um, and thank you. Okay, let me pray. Um, Lord, I pray for these leaders. I pray for the influence, the good influence and, 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 and godly desire that they have to pour into the next generation. Um, I pray for any conflict they help their students navigate um, and what it could arise in their own hearts and their students' hearts and all the things that come uh, up with those types of situations. God, I pray that you would meet them where they are and that you would give words where they may not have them, that you would um, help them because you are, uh, Holy Spirit, you are the helper. And so um, I pray for the rest of this conference that they take away good things um, that help inject life and love and excitement and motivation to do ministry Um, really honoringly and glorifyingly to you, Father. Um, And I pray for, uh, as they close out the year, going into the summer, starting next year, uh, Lord, would you be with them, be with their bodies and strengthen them. Um, Yeah, we love you. We love you so much, Lord. Um, You are the reason this conference exists, ultimately. Um, And you are always good. So we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.